Ellen, I'm the Plants Meow, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you about variegated monstera and simply the tips and tricks that I have in order to grow them very well. <laughs> so as you know, this channel honestly has turned into a mostly anthurium channel, and for a lot of you who don't collect anthurium, I do apologize for that. Um, it kind of just happened. <laughs> But today I wanted to do something other than Ethereum, obviously, and I really wanted to focus on my variegated monsteras. I have quite a few of them, and I've been propagating them a lot recently too, and it's been fun, and I've had a lot of success with them. Now, yes, these tips can be applied to other monsteras, but the reason I'm saying right now it's the variegated monstera is because there's certain things in here that are very applicable to the variegated forms, such as certain light levels. And I'm also going to be focusing on the small leaf variety, which a lot of people know as Borsigiana. The reason there's a lot of confusion behind that term is because scientifically it is not known as Borsigiana. That's just something we attribute to it in order to kind of differentiate the species. But technically this is a monstera deliciosa small leaf form. <laughs> And the reasons they say small leaf, I mean, obviously they aren't tiny leaves, but they don't grow to the mass size that a regular large leaf deliciosa would. And one of the common kind of features that you'll notice on a on the small leaf variety is the large internodal spacing. Now I will talk about how to decrease that in this video, but for the most part, its spacing is gonna be much larger than a regular deliciosa form, which is piled right on top of the other. So the first thing I really want to talk about is soil composition. Now this is the first thing you really want to think about with your alboa because proper drainage is so critical for these plants and that's because they are really prone to root rot. So usually I keep this fairly simple. I just use 50% potting soil and 50% perlite. You can use whatever mix you want as long as your drainage is really good. So feel free to add those other soil amendments. I do have a monstera that is in peat moss and orchid bark and perlite and has a bunch of other things in there. But for the most part, I've been trying to keep it simple, especially because my Ethereum soil composition, if you watch my videos, is so much more complicated and I have so many more things in it. It's kind of nice to be able to make a simpler soil mixture that actually works really fantastically. So the next thing is gonna be water. I typically use room temperature water for my plants because cold water can shock the roots and hot water will burn them so you really want to keep it in that kind of lukewarm temperature and the type of water i use is reverse osmosis water honestly i was feeling so guilty about all the plastic i was using that i did end up installing a reverse osmosis system in my kitchen so i have my regular kitchen spout and then the one i use to water my plants and drink water from which is the reverse osmosis one that ph stays slightly acidic so i like to give all my aeroids between 5.5 and 6 on the ph scale and the reason this is important is it can really stop the absorption of certain nutrients so you can be giving your plants all these nutrients and fertilizers but they may not be able to absorb them if the ph in their soil is just too high or too low and when i do water these guys i do water them very thoroughly so i make sure to completely saturate the soil so if your drip trays do fill up you need to empty those guys because you don't want these plants to reabsorb the water back up after it's had enough water and then this is where your environment really comes to play so before you water your variegated monsters you want to make sure they completely dry out they don't like to be overwatered in any way so in my home, I have three different spots where I keep my variegated monsteras. And honestly, they all have different watering schedules. And that depends on a lot of things. It depends on your humidity. It depends on the kind of pot it is, whether it's terracotta or plastic or big or small. There's just a lot of factors that come into play with how often you're gonna be watering these plants. It's actually really simple when you get used to it, but it's definitely something you're gonna to have to think about when you go to water these monsteras. And this part is really critical because if you don't let it dry out, it can actually produce harmful bacteria in the soil, which will produce root rot. And that is not anything that we want at all. And like I said earlier, they are very prone to root rot. So you really wanna kind of know when they should be watered. And I'm not a fan of touching my soil, not just because I don't mind touching soil, but sometimes I have a systemic on top of my soil and I know there's microorganisms in my soil. So I don't like to kind of dig in there and touch it because I don't want to mess with it. And so I kind of just get a feel of when they dry out and then go from there. And also your girl doesn't have time to go to every plant in this freaking house and just be like, 
oh this is wet oh this is dry and i don't want to shove my finger in every pot it's just it's not something that i deep pleasant <laughs> so now i'm going to quickly just go over these monsteras here and the frequency in which i water them so this monster here which i'm completely in love with <laughs> so as you can see it's in a six inch plastic pot and I keep her in my indoor greenhouse. So one, it's in a plastic pot. So naturally it's not gonna pull moisture from the soil right away like a terracotta pot would. And two, it's in a higher humidity area. So that means less watering is required. So I water this albo every two weeks. She's a stunner. So then in front of me, I have three of my Oreos. <laughs> so I'll quickly go over them. I really, really love this one. <laughs> so this one is a propagation off another one of my Oreos, which I will show you really quickly. So this is the original Oreo, and because she was a mid-cutting, she had to produce a new stem, which means smaller leaves. So if you ever are buying cuttings, if you want continuous large growth, you really want to get the ones that are top cuttings. But the mid cuttings, um, you'll just have to pretty much wait for <laughs> a brand new stem and smaller foliage. So this is the foliage that came off of that, which I'm completely in love with. I took it off because I really like it on its own and I just kind of wanted to grow into its own plant. And I kind of just plan on using the other one to kind of just continuously propagate more babies off of it and have more top cuttings. Honestly, I could have like 50 of these and not be like, I could want more. I absolutely adore the Aurea form. It's so cute. I don't know what about the yellow. I think it's just because it's just the more like rare variety. So we all know the demand for the albums is really high. So if you want to pay the right price, they're common enough that you can get them. They are expensive. Oreos are also expensive, but that's mostly to due to the part that not only is their demand there, not as great as the albos, but it's a rarer plant. So it's just gonna be that much harder cane and still very expensive. And probably you're gonna find these are more expensive than your typical albos. This one, as well as my other two Oreos down here, here's my other Oreo. <laughs> so these are in six inch terracotta pots. One, the terracotta makes them dry out quicker. Two, they're only six inch pots, so they're not too big. And also they remain in my family room, which in winter time can get to 35% humidity. And I don't give them additional humidity in the winter time. I let them be as is, and they've been completely fine with that. So with the lower humidity conditions, smaller terracotta pot, I definitely need to water these at least once a week. So much different from the album we have here. While the pot sizes are both six inch, they are both in very different conditions, meaning I have to water them at different times. And like I said, this is critical because they are so prone to root rot. Now, these two Oreos here, this big one and this one, back in when I first got them, I was not as familiar as when to water them or how well draining my soil composition should be. And so they did both get root rot. I haven't had any problems since. I've had these guys a long time now. It's been slow going for them because of the trauma I inflicted. <laughs> But now they are doing so well. And when it comes to albos being slow growing, I don't find that to be necessarily a thing. If they're getting the proper care, they're pretty like, they're, they're gonna grow for you a lot. So with this one, I received it as a three leaf cutting and I ended up water propagating this cutting. I think I received it, it was, I started water propagating it in mid February and it's now the end of May. And as you can see, she now has four leaves and pretty much the same size as her previous leaves. So I've noticed that when you have a cutting that roots really quickly, then her previous leaf won't have any trouble getting to this larger size. So I do have an albo in my plant room. She took a long time to root. And so her next leaf, while I did have her fenestrations, was much smaller than her previous leaves, unlike this one here. So you want your elbows to root as quick as possible if they can, but if not, like don't feel bad, your, your leaves will still get bigger. And certainly they won't be teeny tiny like this leaf here. <laughs>
And so on the topic of the ones in the plant room, they are in really large terracotta pots. So while there is terracotta there to wick away the moisture, it's very big, so I put a lot of water in there. And also they're kind of in moderate humidity. They're in 55 to 60% humidity. So because of all of those factors, I water them every two weeks as well. It's just like a really a balancing act. It's super simple like when you think about it, but also you have to make sure to actually think about it because if you just go watering these guys too frequently, it'll just become an issue for you. And other things you'll have to think about when you go to watering is the season. So if it's getting hotter or colder and the amount of light they're getting changes, it's really gonna affect whether their soil dries out quickly or not. And also if you opt to do a heavier soil than what I have, you're definitely gonna wanna water them way less. So just think about all the factors, how you can balance them. And watering becomes really simple when you kind of give each one a set schedule. Look how cute she is. So adorable. I just love that one so much. I don't know, the tiny leaves with the fenestrations really get me. I have another monster like this. The other Abu monster I have, I it was my first one and it was actually really slow growing for me because like I said, I wasn't familiar with all the conditions it needed before. So it had initially three leaves and they were all, they all had gradually, you could tell, gotten smaller and smaller. And that was probably because the person who had it before me either took a long time to root it or they didn't give any support for the monstera to climb. And so that resulted in smaller leaves. So now they're gradually starting to get bigger again, but I've lost my fenestrations more or less, but the variegation is on point and I'm so excited about it. <laughs> so the next thing I wanna talk about is light. So a lot of people blame a lot of browning problems on their monsters. They just blame it purely on humidity issues. Now, I found this not to be the case. Like I said, I have all of my Oreos in that lower humidity level. The reason this one has browning on here is because when you have a variegated monstera that needs to root, if it does take a while, it'll often brown on the spots that lack chlorophyll. And that's simply because you know, it's no use to the plant. It doesn't provide any energy that it needs. So those parts often suffer. If you get your monster to root really quickly, then you have less of a chance of them browning. Also, if you give them optimal light levels, you have less of a chance of them browning as well. Because when you give them lower light, the chlorophyll it does have is overcompensating, using a lot of energy. It doesn't need those parts that don't have the energy. So it's fine with killing those off. And also another fantastic reason that you want to give them higher light levels is simply internodal spacing. We want these monsters to grow really quickly and this small variety is known for these really, really long internodal spacing. Now, as you can see with this one here, tell, she has this long one and then she has this shorter one and then the next leaf's even shorter. So as you can tell with the higher light level, her internodal spacing just gets shorter and shorter. The one in my plant room has been showing the same kind of progression. So the one that has been gradually getting smaller, as you, if you look at the internodal spacing, you can tell it's so much smaller than before. And this is just because it's getting the optimal levels to grow, like all the conditions it's in. So it's just gonna grow that much quicker for you. And a really healthy albo can produce you leaves every two weeks to a month. Like it's really fast, really great. Growing season is fantastic for these guys. I've noticed since growing season started, I have a lot of new growth. So I'm so excited about that. And your variegated monsters will thank you for that bright and direct light. You can even use some direct light, but you have to make sure it's not too harsh. So these Oreos, I keep an east facing window and they only get natural lighting and that has suited them really well. So they mostly just get morning sun. They seem to really love it. And I've had no issues with that. Now my greenhouse albums like this one are between two windows that are southeastern facing and while they do get good light and some direct light, I didn't feel like it was enough so I did give them a grow light as well. And then in my plant room, they're kept in a south facing window, but they're actually really far back from it. So I do give all my plants in my plant room some grow lights in order to help supplement that light. The one window I wouldn't really recommend is just keeping them in a north window, even if you have them directly in that window. It's honestly just not enough light for them. It's great for things like ZZ plants, but a north facing window is just gonna cause you troubles. Could you grow an album in a north facing window? Yeah, you could absolutely, but you're gonna notice a slower growth rate and that possibility of browning that none of us want. 
Also keep in mind, depending where you are in the world, this can be different for you. So your north may not be my north facing window. So please keep that in mind and please research your light levels and where you have them strongest in your home. And if you need additional help with this, there are apps you can download that help you measure the foot candles that are coming in through your window. And those are really helpful if you're not sure exactly which window has more light. But always keep in mind that morning sun is much less harsher than that afternoon sun. So if you can kind of gauge where that's coming from, then you kind of know where to place your plants. So the next thing I want to talk about is fertilizing your elbows. I'm gonna move this girl here. I'm really proud of this new leaf she has. It's just super pretty. I love the variegation. I'll admit one of the things I did struggle with most of my plant journey was fertilizing my plants. I definitely did minimal if barely any in the beginning and honestly I was so focused on my anthuriums for a long time that I figured the others can wait which is a terrible philosophy. So that's also a reason for a lot of my slower growth previously in my plant journey, but now I fertilize all of my plants. And I also want you to keep in mind that not fertilizing your plant is like telling your child to write an essay without teaching him the alphabet. And I know I'm like a broker record and I say this like any care video I do, but it's so important. And I don't think people realize that. I get really frustrated when I see people say they don't fertilize their plants because in the long run, it's just gonna be a huge problem. And a lot of nutrient deficiencies don't show up until they've done a lot of damage or it's too late for your plant. So photosynthesis is really reliant on having these proper building blocks within your soil. So I personally use Osmocote 14, 14, 14 for everything. Please keep in mind, I am in an indoor environment. I know a lot of people, I think outside have more problems with Osmocote, so they use Nutricote instead. But indoors, I've had no issues with it. And that is the fruit and vegetable kind. And that's because all these aeroids are capable of producing fruits. So that I like having that balance there. And additionally, along with the Osmocote, I have in recent months started using Liquidert. And that is just an additional supplement for them. If you haven't heard of Liquidert, it's kind of like, it's basically a more concentrated form of newt made by the same people and so much cheaper. So they're getting a lot of good organic things. And if you look it up, it has 18 different ingredients, all organic, all great for your plants. So far, I've been super happy with all my growth season and all the results I'm seeing. So fertilizing these plants is super great. And the reason I use Liquidur on top of Osmocote is Liquidur is one of those organic kind of fertilizers that you can't really measure the like nutrient value in it. It's just there might not be enough in there for your plants. So since it's organic, I use it with Osmocote and I have no issues at all but feel free to use any fertilizer you are comfortable with using. This along with good light is key for faster growth. So now I wanna talk about humidity. And as I've mentioned before, my humidity levels vary greatly. So in my home, you can get anywhere between 35% to 70% humidity, depending where you are. That greenhouse is much larger that I keep my elbows in, so it does stay about roughly 70%. It could go higher, but with these humidities, I have no issues, so my Oreos are totally cool with being kept in this family room in wintertime in that 35% humidity. And I would say the main benefit to humidity is that encouragement of growth. So I noticed things in higher humidity tend to grow much faster than things in lower, but if you're taking care of these variegated monsteras properly in every other way, you know, lighting, watering, soil composition, fertilizing, then really humidity becomes much less of an issue. I don't like to blame humidity on everything. I think it's kind of nonsensical, especially when I can grow these with no issues in that kind of lower to moderate humidity. I'm a big proponent in just not blaming it. It's just not the end all thing. <laughs> I still see so many people that just say, oh gosh, the only answer to everything is humidity. And it's just like, being a proper plant parent is looking beyond that and seeing like what could be the actual issue. Don't assume it's humidity just because something's wrong. And that's really the main takeaway <laughs> that I have here with humidity. Now, something that is vital for these smaller leaf variety plants is a climbing pole. 
You can use anything for these plants as long as you attach them to it. So if they can't attach themselves because you're using, say, a PVC pipe or just a wooden stake, as long as you have some kind of Velcro, wrap it on that stake, it'll continue to grow bigger leaves because it's, it still feels that structure and support next to it. So it doesn't inhibit the growth in any way. You don't have to have a moss pole. I do have some of mine on moss poles, but like this one, I currently have it on a stake. I'll probably be, I'll be giving it something else later, but honestly, that's all I have it on right now. And it's velcroed on. These smaller ones, I definitely have to put on one. I probably will end up putting this one, giving it a little pull this week, just to continually encourage that growth. But yeah, as long as it's secure onto there, you're pretty much golden. I've seen online some gigantic ones and they're usually just attached to some kind of large stick. It's fantastic. <laughs> not saying not to use moss poles because they will love those as well. But if you're not a fan of moss poles or you don't like watering them all the time, it's still great to just, as long as you give them something, they'll have something to latch onto. And the great thing about it is when you do give them encouragement, they do produce aerial roots as they feel more confident. And you can also, and this makes it so much easier if you ever wanna do a propagation, you could just snip it here, place it in water, and it's good to go. It's, oh my gosh, it's so much quicker to root one of these if you have an aerial root that's just forming that hasn't gone quite brown yet. It can be adapted to water if you choose to water propagate it. That's what I did with this one. And I think in like a week and a half, two weeks, I just potted it in soil because it already had sufficient roots. It was fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, if that's something you want to do, it's a great thing. But also, like I said before, keep in mind when you do propagate these plants that this bottom part of the plant will no longer produce leaves like this size. It'll have to grow a brand new stem and it'll start producing smaller leaves than it had previously. So if you don't want that to happen, don't take a cutting off of this plant, which is another reason I really don't get asked for free cuttings or anything, which is cool. I know a lot of people do, but that is one of the reasons you wouldn't want to do it, right? So why would you want to kind of like, you're asking someone to essentially kind of ruin their plant. <laughs> Top cuttings to me are the best. I mid, There's also nothing wrong with mid cuttings. If you're cool with growing a plant kind of from scratch or just a smaller like size than what you previously had, that's completely fine too. But if you like a very simple, elegant structure and you don't like all this like kind of variety and leaf shape going on, you're gonna wanna keep your top cuttings. So like this plant, I just didn't have the heart. I don't have the heart to cut. It's growing beautifully. I love how these three leaves are here, how this leaf is here. It actually has a new leaf growing right here that you just can't see yet. It's really a fantastic specimen and I love how bushy it's growing. So this is a plant I don't see myself ever cutting unless it like reached my ceiling, which I hope it does. <laughs> I think about that sometimes and I get a little bit disheartened because I don't ever want to chop these plants. Like I don't want them to even reach my ceiling and then me have to kind of do something about it. So I don't know. At least my ceiling is not too short, so it has a lot of time. And I have a lot of time to think about that. <laughs> so now really quickly before we finish off this video, I wanted to talk about variegation on these plants. So when you think about like your Thai constellations, which have been tissue cultured, you know that their variegation is stable. They are able to replicate that with their tissue culture and you'll never have to worry about it reverting. With these albos and these oreos, their variegation is not stable. So what that means is every new leaf can look fairly different. They'll always be similar to the previous leaf, but not always in its entirety. So if we look at this plant here, you can see it does, they are similar, but it goes through stages. This one's very marbled. This one has some patches of green. This one has a lot of green on this side. And this one has a distinct amount of white on it, on its new leaf. So when you're looking for an elbow, you wanna really look at the stem of the plant. And the leaves are definitely reflective of that stem. So keep that in mind as well. But also your leaves may not look like the next. It's just completely unstable, which honestly, it's kind of the joy of these because you never know what you're gonna get. And one day this can turn into a highly variegated plant or a low or a very low variegated plant. So when you look at the stem of this plant, it has a good amount of green and white. So it's 
definitely what you'd be looking for. This whole like striped white and green thing going on. It's really a fantastic, fantastic specimen. And you know, it's gonna produce like fant phenomenal variegation. It's just gonna look fantastic. <laughs> and even if you do happen to get a stem with lower variegation, it can turn into one with higher variegation one day. It's just kind of luck of the draw, but really try to look for a stem with good variegation when you are getting one of these plants, just to kind of guarantee your success in that way. If you get a stem obviously with no variegation, there's, there's very little guarantee that you'll be getting a plant that is variegated. So I wanted to show you really quickly just like the new growth on this elbow that I had in the video. So I'm super happy with it. Like I said, it had that new leaf growing in and this is it now. Even more variegation than the previous leaves, which is really awesome. She's so beautiful. And I just wanted to quickly just show you the stem on this girl. So if you look at her, she has such good like marbling all over her stem. And also something I don't think I mentioned in the video is that some people have albos whose brand new leaf is all green. But what they're not considering is that they the new leaf may grow out from a part of the stem that has a ton of green on it. So it's not the plant's fault. It's still going to be a variegated plant. And really, in those cases, you should wait until the next leaf. I've actually had a couple now that I've grown where every other leaf is green. And ones like these, when they have the variegation so nice throughout the stem on all sides, you're just always gonna get really nice variegation. And then I wanted to also show you what I did with aerial roots. So what I like to do with them is just kind of like position them and put them in the soil when they get long enough so they grow into it really nicely and provide additional support. I will be repotting this girl soon. She'll go on a much better pole than what she has now. Another thing you want to look for when buying these plants is if you receive a mid cutting, look for an auxiliary bud. A lot of the times people buy cuttings of these plants because it's more affordable to do so. If they are fresh brand new cuttings, they may not have an auxiliary bud right away, which makes it very difficult because sometimes people that sell these plants cut them in the wrong places. They'll cut through the auxiliary bud, they will cut it too low so there'll be barely any stem on top. You really want some stem on top so the auxiliary bud has a place to form. So I really recommend when you're buying one of these plants to just get a rooted plant, whether it's a top cutting or mid cutting with an auxiliary bud already, because rooted plants should already have the auxiliary bud formed, whether it's just starting to bud out or it's actually already starting to form to a stem. And this also is where prices are gonna change for you a lot, and that sucks. But honestly, someone who is selling a healthy rooted plant that they spent months growing is not gonna charge the same amount as someone who just took a cutting and just wants to sell it right away. A rooted plant with new growth is a guarantee of success. And an unrooted cutting that was just cut wrong will not grow into a full plant. You may just have a plant that remains a single leaf forever. If you've ever wondered about some of the propagations that you have that haven't grown another leaf, it's probably because the cutting was made wrong and you're just gonna be stuck with one leaf forever. That's kind of the sad truth of cuttings, especially unrooted cuttings. You really don't know what you're gonna be getting. And if they've cut through that auxiliary bud, they've really, really messed up there. <laughs> so if you wanna take the gamble, I get it, it's less expensive. But honestly, if you really, really want this plant and you want it to succeed, get one that is rooted and that has that auxiliary bud. Now that auxiliary bud only applies for mid cuttings. Like I've mentioned, if you cut it and you're selling that bottom part or a mid cutting you've done, Top cuttings on the other hand, let's say I took this plant and cut it here. So it's just these two top leaves, right? So the great thing about it is this new growth here, it's just gonna keep continuing this way. Top cuttings are ideal, but they're also gonna be slightly more pricey as well. So people will sell you cheaper mid cuttings because it's gonna be a lot more work for you to do obviously in the long run. Not everyone wants to pay for a top cutting. Mid cuttings are great. If you get a rooted mid cutting with that auxiliary bud, then that's awesome because you know you're gonna get a healthy plant one day. If you want it faster, pay that, pay for that top cutting. That's really all I can say about that. So, but also be aware that cutting a lot, I feel like a lot of people expect their cuttings to produce another big leaf right after. But remember, if it's just simply a mid cutting, 
that's not gonna happen. These variegated monsters are in so high demand that people don't think about that. And it's not the job of the seller to inform you about things like that because that's something that going into buying these plants, you should really research and know. So making this video today was really just kind of my helpful guide in trying to show you how best to take care of your new variegated monstera and what to expect from it. So my mid cutting that I have here, I am completely in love with it. I think it has fantastic variegation. Is it sad that the leaves won't be this size? Yes, but also I can have a bunch of pups that I can produce from this. So I have no issues. Like mid cuttings are great for that. And honestly, if you're someone who has one, you can create a bunch of plants by just continually propagating it. I'm not a fan of the look having tiny leaves growing from these bigger ones. So eventually when it produces more leaves, I will propagate, I will propagate it more. But that's also because I want a bunch of these plants. And when I do propagate it, I'll have a bunch of top cuttings after that that'll grow really big, which is really cool. So <laughs> I really love propagating these plants. I think to create more plants is just something that we could all use and need. Like, I absolutely adore it. Look how cute they are. This one's still hardening, so his color's not as dramatic, which is also another thing. Your plants will take a little while to harden. If you're not entirely thrilled with how the variegation's looking, it's probably mostly because it has not hardened off yet. A plant, when it's just growing in to the point where it is hardened, it looks fairly different. Especially these Oreos, I found that they're such a pale green color when they grow in and then they get this dramatic look to them after. So as you can see here, like that, I mean, I still like it, the little lime color look, but it's definitely gonna look more dramatic like this one when it is hardened. Okay, so I just wanted to give you some quick updates. So if you remember this cutting here, it actually has grown another leaf already. And this one that is one that has yet to harden, super cute. And on my mid cutting over here, so I had, I believe, that small leaf starting to grow when I filmed that last video. And it's actually been a few weeks. And surprisingly, it's already pushed out another leaf. Now again, um, you won't really see the variegation in this until it hardens but they're just gonna be so beautiful and I'm very excited. So I really hope you found this video really helpful. I absolutely adore my Monsteras. So I was really excited to get to kind of finally talk about them and offer some of my care tips for people because they're honestly really simple and easy growing plants if you just know how to take care of them. If this was helpful to you, please give me a like. Any comments down below or feedback would be greatly appreciated. And if you wanna see more content, please subscribe. I do wanna let you guys know I will probably be taking a few weeks off from YouTube just to kind of recoup and get a lot of things organized and done. I've had a lot of things going on behind the scenes that keep me fairly busy. So I kind of would like to just step back and figure all of that out. So not going away completely. I love you all. And I really want to thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it so much. And I want to thank you all for being so supportive and kind. All of my viewers are fantastic and I've been so overwhelmed by everyone's responses to all my videos and it's been really amazing being here on YouTube and I want to tell you it's obviously nothing to do with you guys. I just need a little bit of time and I want to thank you in advance for just being completely understanding of that and I can't wait to come up with some great content for all of you. Thank you so much.